This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Five years ago, deep in a bear market, a group of traditional finance experts founded BitGet, and they've been building ever since. Now, with 20 million users worldwide, BitGet is committed to helping users trade smarter by providing a secure one-stop crypto investment solution with copy trading, future trading, and spot trading. Your security is their priority, and BitGet has one of the largest protection funds in the industry, with US $300 million to cover potential trader losses from unforeseen events that are not due to misconduct from the user or platform. BitGet wants to inspire everyone to embrace Web3, so if you're new to crypto, learn more at the BitGet Academy with free blockchain courses, crypto guides, cryptocurrency trading strategies, and more. Or for the experienced investor, trade smarter with daily access to institutional-grade crypto market intelligence and trends analysis with BitGet Research. I've put links to BitGet Research and the BitGet Academy in the show notes, so get amongst it or simply go to bitget.com. Thank you to BitGet, and now it is on with the show. My guest today is Jeff Owens. Jeff Owens is a co-founder of Haven One, an EVM compatible layer one blockchain designed to offer a secure, trusted environment uh, to help drive the mass adoption of on-chain finance. We'll learn all about this today. Uh, welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks for having me, Andy. I appreciate it. Hey, it is a pleasure. Let's do what we do at the beginning of the show, Jeff. Be great if you could please introduce yourself. i uh, love to hear a little bit about your a personal and professional story and uh, what you've been doing uh, before you got involved with uh, DeFi, Haven One, uh, the Yield app, all that good stuff. Sure. Yeah. So um, I have a background is my is in engineering uh, and design. I actually had two degrees growing up. Uh, built and scaled a couple of companies, uh, including co-founding a few. Um, most recently, I was actually a co-founder of Coinbag, which is an institutional grade digital asset management tool in the DeFi space. Uh, my journey into crypto started about 2015, end of 2015, and kind of just been dabbling in it for a long time. Uh, been super interested in the space. I got into DeFi when it came out in 2020. I uh, have been investing, advising, uh, and then obviously building in the space for a while. Uh, and then I met uh, Tim and the team over at YieldApp uh, in the past like couple of years. And we've just been kind of figuring out you know, what are the next big things that are needed in the space. And that's ultimately how we ended up landing on Haven One. And so we decided to join forces with them. Uh, Coinbag is still running, but yeah, decided to join forces with them to build out Haven One uh, in the hopes of really bringing on that next phase of, of mass on-chain finance and Web3 adoption. Uh, sounds very good. So let, let's just make the distinction then. Just just give us the very brief, um, uh, I guess, uh, highlights of, of what Yield App is, uh, and then we can transition into Haven One. Sure. Yeah. So Yield App is just a, a earned platform that's out there. So they also offer exchange services, OTC services, um, different different things within the space today. Um, you know, they've been around for a few years now. Uh, kind of off the back of of DeFi and and um, they offer both uh, int- they basically offer flat interest rates to customers and this is then uh, earned for customers through different centralized uh, trading strategies as well as uh, DeFi earned strategies. Yep. And so, what was the I suppose the uh, what, what's the origin story then uh, for Haven Haven One? Yeah. So. Um, with Haven One, it really started with uh, the DeFi team over at YieldApp. So uh, at their peak, they had about 600 million plus in asset center management. Um, and of that, 250 million was being deployed into DeFi. So it was about 100 million into stables, uh, 150 million into uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, just through general DeFi strategies, liquidity provisioning, uh, yield farming, et cetera. And over time, they really started to struggle to be able to deploy capital on chain in a secure way into DeFi. Um, And so they had actually built this very robust uh, risk based model. The team there comes from a predictive analytics background. And uh, as a result, they were actually exposed to zero of the DeFi hacks that have occurred. Um, But as a result of that, they also really struggle to be able to actually deploy capital into DeFi today. Um, and you know, this is around audits not being kept up to date. This is around um, just general lack of recourse on chain. So if there is a hack, it's really difficult to actually 
uh, pull back or claw back the funds, which when you're looking to deploy that amount of money on chain, uh, security is one of the most important things that's there. And so uh, really the ethos of decentralization takes a different meaning uh, when it comes to, uh, I guess, institutional adoption of, of Web3. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in terms of uh, Web3, you know, I, I thought it was really interesting the way that uh, you guys, it's on uh, one of your blog posts, you know, you talk about um, paving uh, the path from uh, Web 2.5 uh, to, I guess, Web3 or on-chain finance uh, with Haven 1. And you talk about in, in the blog how, I guess, you know, the, the current state of the internet is at a bit of a pit stop uh, with, you know, Web 2.5, right? Because the, the mm -hmm. Web3 transition uh, is going to be a, a little bit more challenging, a little bit more complex than uh, the transition from Web1 to Web2, just because of the complexity involved. So maybe just put into context a, a little bit about, yeah, what, what you guys mean by that and, and how you're hoping to uh, help ease that evolution from web 2.5 to uh, to web 3 yeah so you know i think when we look at the the i guess the the build up of what is defi today we we're expecting to see the usability a little bit further along and so um, you know, if you look at the, I guess, overall adoption of, of crypto today, depending on the stat that you look at, there's between 300 million to 425 million uh, verified exchange users. And these are people that are actually holding crypto and showing that they have an appetite for crypto. When you actually look at the users that are active in Web3, this is looking at, you know, people that are, are actively doing an action over a 30 day period. It's less than 5 million users, uh, but the actual wallets is about 20 20 million, 20, 25 million users. So that means that money has actually flowed into Web3 and then for some reason it's actually flowed out. And I think a lot of this comes down to uh, kind of two big things, which is, and this comes from also a lot of research that we've done internally with uh, the clients over at YieldApp, but number one is that the, the common thread is that uh, Web3 or DeFi is too scammy. So uh, the, the hacks that we see are at a whole different level of any other hack that we've seen, even in compared to traditional finance. And they're very complex. And so as users coming in to interact with Web3 today, they're actually every single interaction that they're doing, they're, inter they're interacting with a basically financial contract, which is the smart contract. And that's a ton of power that's given to the developers who really don't have any fiduciary responsibility to the user that they're interacting with. And so it creates this really weird dynamic that exists between the two. Um, and so as a result of that, you see a lot of exploits that come out of this. So that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is that just the overall user experience is very complex. Like if you want to um, take what are the affordances that users have in traditional finance, this is having things like a, a 24 seven support. This is um, having an account with an email address, not a, a 12 word mnemonic phrase uh, to manage their account that if they lose it, they lose their funds forever. Um, there's a big disconnect between you know, trying to bring on all those users from these exchanges and even just traditional finance applications into Web3 today because the, the user experience affordances don't exist. And so teaching the masses this is something that I think is quite difficult. And even at Coinbag, we saw this on the business side. So businesses you would think would be able to adopt this faster than some some of the retail in terms of understanding private key management but there's there's too many complexities that come with it and at the end of the day people do need to have a counterparty there to be able to you know hold accountable in the case that something does go wrong with their money yeah very much so very much so uh well that's that's really good context then um Jeff, so if that's the case, maybe, yeah, let, let's just explain again um, exactly what Haven One is, really, uh, just so the, the listeners can kind of understand, um, you know, what you're building and, again, you know, perhaps um, talk about some of the, the different uh, target market or customer segments that you're really building this thing for. Sure. So um, as you mentioned earlier, Haven One is a EVM compatible layer one blockchain, and it's really built on bringing some of the core principles from traditional finance uh, into Web3. And these are oftentimes things that users don't need to, that ones that are interacting with the smart contracts don't need to ever uh, think about. And so the, the three core principles that Haven One is built off of is number one, accountability. So for Haven One, every single protocol is required to go through three smart contract audits at the time, uh, like before they ever deploy on. And the deployment's actually not done by the protocol, but it's done at governance level. So they give basically a, a deployment key to governance who then can deploy their contract after they've met everything. Think of this as like um, 
the Apple App Store analogy. So Apple, if you want to submit your app to Apple, you go through a review process with them. We want to bring that same standard to Web3 today uh, because there is a big problem where a lot of times protocols claim to be audited, but they're not actually held accountable to keep those audits up to date over time. So the second principle that Haven One has is that there will be identity verification done for every single user that comes on to Haven One. Um, and what this does is it actually enables the third pillar, which is recourse. Uh, but I'll talk about both of those kind of individually. So identity verification, the way that it'll work is it's actually done at our bridge level. So it's not done on chain. So the bridge works, we work with regulated entities that have their own AML and KYC, AML is anti-money laundering and KYC is know your customer procedures where you have to submit your identity verification in. So they already have all these procedures in place and they're checking for OFAC, so making sure that the funds coming in are clean. Um, and then what they do is they actually will mint an NFT, an anonymized NFT that's associated to that user's wallet on chain. So that will contain pieces of metadata like the country that the user comes from, the level of verification they've done, are they an accredited investor, are they a politically exposed individual? And then these are actually tools that become available to developers to create, let's say, a geofence application on chain. So that's the identity verification. And then the third part of this is actually recourse. So recourse uh, is probably one of the most important things that is not existing in DeFi today, which is that everything is permanent on chain as it stands today. And that's a big issue. And so with Haven One, uh, because we know the counterparties through the bridge level, we can actually start to deploy certain types of recourse where if there is a hack that occurs, we know the actual counterparties that we're interacting with. And so we can go after them uh, to make sure that the funds get deployed get returned back to the people that were not the, the fraudsters in this case. Um, and so this also allows us to do things like anomaly detection on chain and a lot of cool things that, that uh, reduce some of the permanency that exists on blockchain today. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a lot of information there, but um, at the end of the day, you know, our target audience kind of falls into two buckets. So the first bucket is gonna be the web 2.5 users as we were alluding to earlier these are the people that are holding crypto today on an exchange or with a centralized product and they're looking to potentially start to do self-custody themselves and be their own bank so control their own funds because whether we like it or not today if you have it with an exchange no matter how reputable it is you don't necessarily know that your funds are completely safe there and so you know that's the first target market for us and that's kind of what we consider the low-hanging fruit the second is we're actually working with several uh, traditional finance companies that are offering, let's say, like I'll give you an example. So there's a wealth management tool and they're offering stocks, bonds and ETFs to their clients today. And they want to tokenize all of those securities on chain. But in order for them as the underlying custodian to take on that risk of moving of basically tapping into extra liquidity, having real-time settlements or instant settlements, they need to know that the network that they're building on adheres to their own internal risk standards. And so this is where the audits come in. This is where recourse comes in because they can't be left there you know, with a, a bag of, of nothing if there is a hack that occurs uh, on you know, a, a layer one blockchain that's out there. Um, so that's really like the two target markets that we're going after. And then uh, there is a third ancillary one, which I think most layer ones are targeting, which is just Web3 builders. So this is examples of, of uh, some like tokenized T-bills. This is a big uh, move or push that's been happening over the past six months. Um, so it's a very interesting opportunity for them to come in um, and build on top of Haven One because of those uh, security frameworks. We're looking at other like DeFi funds that are out there looking to deploy capital. We're talking 100 million plus funds looking to deploy capital in a more secure way and still offer their clients interest. Um, those are the, the Web3 builders that we're looking for as well. Yeah, some uh, fascinating ideas uh, in there actually, Jeff. So uh, what I'm, what I'm hearing is, you know, with, with Haven One, uh, you, you, you're kind of building a platform that combines, I guess, some of the um, some of the guardrails, if you like, of uh, more traditional <laughs> finance or, or Web2, but with, of course, you know, the, the added uh, functionality and, well, you know, freedom uh, to transact that DeFi represents. Of course, Jeff, look, I'm sure you'd be only too well aware that there would be a certain segment of, let's just say, you know, blockchain maxis or, or freedom maxis that are going to hear, you know, when you talk about um, the need for identity, whether or not it's, you know, full KYC, but kind of identity goes against, it, it's not necessarily what a lot of DeFi maximalists uh, would want to see. And this idea of the kind of the app store analogy that you used as well. I love that. I mean, it's great for protecting uh, people, protecting the average user, which is 
the vast majority of, uh, you know, when the next adoption wave happens, most of those people do need a little bit of protection because of all the scams and et cetera, et cetera. But what, what do you kind of say to the, I guess, the the hardcore DeFi guys that, that want everything to remain, I guess, a little bit wild west is the easy way to say it. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. And it's a great question. And, you know, frankly speaking, I am one of those people. Uh, so it's sure. like building an application like this is a little bit counterintuitive, especially when I talk to my network of people. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, there are already hundreds of these solutions out there for people like myself or the DeFi DGENs that exist. Yes. And so this is really not targeting those people. I, we, we, we actually oftentimes say that we're very complementary to those products where there needs to be this bridge that sits in between and bridge is maybe a bad term, but there needs to be a solution that sits in between these, which allows people to think of it as like DeFi or on-chain finance with trading wheels. That's kind of what Haven One is, is meant to be. Like if you want to go full on Wild West, if we're going to use that term, uh, you have that capability. And so, um, you know, it's I think it's kind of bridging that, that gap that isn't being solved today by, by a lot of solutions that are already existing. Yeah, and, and I think that's very well said. And I, I think you're exactly right because really, you know, you and I, Jeff, we both know if, if we are to uh, scale out the adoption of, of DeFi protocols to uh, yeah, even small amounts of the mainstream, then uh, I think, what did you say? DeFi with training wheels? That's a, a great way of putting it. And th these, these kind of products are very much needed, aren't they? Very much so. And, you know, I think it also it ironically goes into a lot of businesses, you know, like when we're talking about like, what is, how do you really bring on a significant amount of TVL into to blockchain? And this actually comes into the to tokenization of assets. And uh, what people don't understand is as the custodian, like in order to have a tokenization of assets, you need to have an underlying custodian. And that underlying custodian is the one that's taking on all of the risk when there's no recourse on chain. And so, you know, it's not just solving necessarily like the retail that, does, that wants to move from an exchange into on-chain finance, but it's also trying to bring the bridge the gap between the businesses that are looking to move a significant amount of real-world assets uh, onto onto the blockchain. Yeah, very much so. And for those businesses that are going to do that, they're only going to do that on uh, platforms or, or protocols or, or products um, that they can have uh, some level of trust in. They're not they're not going to do it on uh, some super obscure uh, DeFi protocol that may or may not be around in, in a month's time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. At least based on the market research that we've been doing, we've been finding the same. Yeah. And look, uh, just if we zoom out a bit then, Jeff, just to change tack slightly, you know, it's it's pretty interesting times uh, at the moment. I'm sure you've noticed um, in crypto, look, we're almost halfway through December, end of 2023. Uh, of course, the, the big narratives or, the, or the, the tailwinds behind Bitcoin are, of course, you know, the, the high likelihood of, the, of the, the spot ETFs being approved in January. And of course, the halving uh, coming up, uh, you know, in, in April, a few months after that. So we've seen a, a a pretty good um, uh, market bounce in, in the last few months and, and positive signs ahead. But I suppose, you know, digging into maybe just DeFi more specifically, yeah, where, where would you characterize a, a DeFi at, at the moment? And as much as, you know, we've, we've talked about something like Haven One, yeah, providing that uh, those training wheels, if you like, for the, the next wave of people, um, yeah, how, how are we going to reach them? What what needs to happen for, for that next uh, wave of people to come through and, and have the confidence to start using things like Haven One? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like if it, you, can, you have to separate out like the the having and the the Bitcoin ETF uh, from you know what is DeFi as, as you did there. Um, I think if you look at the total TVL at its peak, it was like 172 uh, billion for DeFi, which uh, has actually it's plummeted since you know the, a lot of the, the issues that have happened. I think basically starting with Luna uh, yeah. in May of 2000. What, what was it? May of 2022. Yeah. Um, and so you know I think that there has been a lot of uh, there, there's been a massive lack of trust moving on. You see this based on like the set I was talking about earlier, where activity in Web3 and, and DeFi is, is the low, uh, and yet the, there's a lot of, of wallets that have been created, um, and so. You know, I, I don't want to preach too hard on, on what we're talking about here, but I think, you know, to take a different angle on and not just talk about Haven, I think a big, a big gap that exists today is that institutions oftentimes drive uh, retail adoption. 
and the trust that institutions have within certain solutions that are out there will will give the confidence back to retail uh, on, I think, DeFi. And so this is actually probably why you see the momentum of something like an ETF come out. And, and what that kind of signals is that when institutions and big names are getting behind crypto, uh, retail will set, tend to, to flood in. And so um, I do think at the end of the day, you need to, in order to actually really bring you know, DeFi to mass adoption, you need to really target in, like mass institutional adoption that is targeting retail. Think of it like B to B to C. So it's bringing on those those wealth uh, platforms onto Haven One or onto, I should say, on-chain finance and allowing them to tokenize assets that uh, then tap into new liquidity sources, provide better rates to, to retail because that's ultimately, there's so many intermediaries that exist in traditional finance today that all take a, a cut, which actually then affects the prices for consumers. And so if you can start to show retail that when bigger institutions that are offering the tools that they otherwise, or the, the products that they otherwise would be looking to buy can offer it for more competitive rates. Uh, you know, that becomes a very interesting sign for retail to start moving on. And, you know, at the end of the day, hopefully people don't need to know that they're even on uh, on blockchain or on DeFi. Uh, but that's, a, I think, a ways down, down the line. Yeah, but that is uh, certainly, yeah, where we would ultimately want to head. Let's just... Um... Give us a sense of where Haven One is at then in terms of, I guess, I don't know, like the, the product roadmap or the yeah, the, the rollout of test nets, main nets. Uh, where, where are we at at the moment? Yeah, so um, Haven One, actually, we just went into our public test net on December 7th. Um, so we do have a wait list to join. So anybody that wants to go and check it out can go um, join the wait list. And that will, the earlier you join for our wait list, the more incentives that you can earn with our, our airdrops. Um, but within the actual public test net, uh, we'll probably have a four to six month period in between where we're testing and learning based on market feedback, bringing on developers, uh, working closely with our strategic validators. Um, at the same time as well, one of the unique things for Haven One is that we're actually creating our own like core protocols that are at the governance level. So we'll have our own DEX solution. We'll have our own lending market. We'll have our own uh, perps market. NFT marketplace and account name service, so like an ENS uh, domain name service. So um, those five core protocols will be uh, actually governed by the network. And what that does is actually concentrates liquidity. So we're like, you've probably also seen that most of the time that these are the core protocols that get built on a new layer one. And then oftentimes they get replicated uh, pretty quickly, which actually fragments liquidity on chain, which causes issues for consumers. And so um, I say all that in the sense that um, over the next four to six months, we'll slowly be rolling those protocols out uh, for the public test net. We just have our swap protocol on there today. And then there's a few other uh, cool things you can do around uh, minting your identity NFT um, and a few other small things. But yeah, over the next four to six months, we're going to be kind of rolling more stuff out. So uh, please feel free to have your, your audience join. All right. Well, look, as I guess we finish up this part of the podcast, then Jeff, you know, tell people how they can do that. You know, you, you talked about uh, how there's a, a wait list and, you know, the earlier you potentially get involved, uh, well, the, the the stronger the incentives, uh, airdrops, all that good stuff uh, might be. So just for, for people that are perhaps interested in, uh, yeah, taking an early look at Haven One, um, what is the, the best thing that they can do? Uh, where should they go? What should they do? Sure. So you, all you have to do is go to haven1.org and then there's a join test net button. Um, and then what we'll have you do is we'll have you actually connect your MetaMask wallet, wallet connect wallet, whatever it may be. Um, and then you'll be added to the wait list. And then we'll send out an email the moment that you get uh, you get approved. So it can any be anywhere from 24 hours to uh, 48 hours that the approval process typically takes. And then obviously, the more people will flood in, uh, that may get drawn out a bit more. But um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Awesome. So links in the show notes, folks, but yeah, haven1.org is the website. All right, well, I reckon we go to a very quick break and then uh, we'll come back, we'll have some fun. Uh, we'll finish off by running Jeff through the very famous Crypto Conversation Hot Take Round. Uh, back in one moment. All done. You mean the toast? Something tastier. I've just copied an elite trader on BitGap. One click and it's done. What do you mean? Well, I don't have to sit here manually spying on the moves of smart money and crypto and copying them. I just have to click once, sit back, BitGet does the rest. You are so lazy. It's about working smarter, not harder. 
copy it until you make it. Hands off, gains up. Start copy trading on BitGet. All right, we are back and I'm with Jeff Owens. Jeff is a co-founder at Haven One, uh, a new EVM compatible layer one blockchain, uh, kind of described as DeFi with training wheels, which uh, I I like, <laughs> actually. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great concept and much needed uh, to really help uh, encourage yeah, the next wave for people into uh, the wonder world, wonderful world of crypto, DeFi, on-chain finance, etc. Look, uh, Jeff, I'd like to finish each podcast with a quick round of rapid-fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it, Jeff. Just going to run some questions at you. Just no right or wrong way to do it. Just give us your uh, honest answers. A uh, bit of a funny one to start, but where would you say that you sit on uh, the Bitcoin maximalist uh, to multi-chain opportunist spectrum, Jeff? Ooh, that's an interesting one. I think I'm, I'm much more on the multi, multi-chain multi uh, optimalist uh, side of the, the coin, though I do uh, lo- love my Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, yeah, who doesn't? But yeah, very uh, sensible answer. I would say in today's climate, uh, but Jeff, what would you say is your firmest conviction crypto opinion um well i think that there that that mass institutional adoption is coming and, and, and real world asset tokenization is real um so i think it's oftentimes kind of swept under the rug and and, and people don't realize how big tokenization of assets can be and is um, and so i do think that that's coming it's not a matter of of when it's met or if it's a matter of when Sure. So, uh, well, let's talk about that then. So, you know, Jeff, Bill Gates famously said that we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. So, you know, uh, tokenization of real world assets, uh, 10 years is a long time uh, in blockchain. So what is what does that uh, tokenization of, of real world assets start to look like in 10 years time? Ooh, that, that's interesting. Well, I think You'll, you'll see it in 10 years time, potentially percolate down to everything from, you know, like what's, we'll start with securities like bonds, ETFs, uh, stocks, and then in 10 years, it'll be things like coffee, it'll be purchasing, you know, even things like, uh, I, I don't know, I'm looking at post-it notes right now, like it could go very, very far down uh, the, the trend, but um, I don't, I honestly don't think it'll take 10 years to, to get that far, um, it, just in my, my own opinion. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, sci-fi author William Gibson said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, can you think of an example of the future being here right now, Jeff? Uh, but most people aren't aware of it. Uh, that's an easy one. Uh, Web3 and DeFi. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, you, you can see it based on the, the number that we were talking about earlier. But uh, yeah, with, with basically 50, 50 billion in TBL locked with the total global equities market being over like, what is it, like 125 trillion in the next seven years. Like there's, yeah, clear, clear uh, spirit or um, uneven distribution between the two. Yep, absolutely. All right. Um, well, time to finish this off, Jeff. Uh, the final question is, uh, what is your favorite science fiction book, film or TV show? That's a good question. Um, probably Blade Runner. Uh, it's kind of a, a lame answer, I feel, but uh, probably probably one of my favorite, just because it, it's uh, I, I like the the apocalyptic style where you know humans are still around and trying to, to scrape through and, and compete against uh, the existing technologies that are out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can't argue with that. Of course, uh, yeah, Blade Runner uh, was based on a book by um, Richard. What's his name? Richard K. Dick. Yeah, short story by Richard K. Dick, and then, what, 1982 sci-fi film uh, by Ridley Scott, and then, of course, yeah, there's a a new update recently, but yeah, uh, yeah, one of the the cyberpunk originals, can't argue with that. Um, (laughs) I'm talking to you today, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show and spending some time with us. Again, just to finish off, please uh, make the case. Uh, for what Haven One is hoping to do, uh, when you're going to do it, and and how people can get on board uh, and join the ride. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I think the the main thing with Haven One is it's it's providing a secure guardrail ecosystem for you to transact on chain. Um, so this is through things like mandatory smart contract audits, so you don't have to worry about that. 
um, making sure that there's recourse on chain uh, so that you're, you know, if a hack does occur, you can get your funds back. And it's really bringing those traditional finance principles on chain, giving you a very familiar experience, uh, but in a much better um, secure framework. So uh, our public test net goes live or is already live as of December 7th. So feel free to join by going to haven1.org. All you have to do is go to join test net and then follow the steps uh, and you can get into the wait list. And uh, over the next four to six months, we're looking at end of Q1, early Q2, 2024 to do our main net launch. So uh, stay tuned and feel free to join us on, and follow us on any of our socials. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. All the best and bye for now. All right. Thanks, Andy. Bye. All right. There you go. That was Jeff from Haven One. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, lots of things, but it boils down to DeFi with training wheels. I like it. That's a great, great concept. Great idea. Much needed. Bring it on. All the best uh, to Jeff and the team uh, for achieving that vision. Uh, of course, uh, the website again, haven1.org. Link is in the show notes. Uh, do get amongst it. And yeah, Blade Runner. Of course, Blade Runner is a classic. And yeah, I was reaching for uh, Philip K. Dick. Is that what I said? Philip K. Dick is the author, of course, um, the short story that he wrote back in 1968, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, um, which was the inspiration for Blade Runner. But um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Yeah, dystopian sci-fi novel from 1968 set in post-apocalyptic San Francisco. Uh, the main plot, of course, follows a Rick Deckard, a bounty hunter who has to retire six escaped Nexus 6 model androids. Yeah, great stuff. Blade Runner. All right, well, thank you, uh, Jeff, for, yeah, bringing Blade Runner to us on today's show <laughs> some uh abstract facts from me all right better finish this off folks um we've reached the end of another show so thank you for listening uh thank you to jeff and the team at haven one uh but that is it for today please make sure you're subscribed to the crypto conversation and whatever podcast app you are using uh but it's bye for now thanks team this was the crypto conversation for brave new coin see ya